Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is begin um, with you, Olodamni, because uh, about your article, <clears throat> and sort of lay the groundwork for us, if you will, about the colonial legacy, both um, the kind of education it fostered and set up and implemented, uh, we refer to it as modern education, mm -hmm. what does it mean to have a modern education, what is that? And then also what was lost in doing so, what was lost with the traditional um, cultures and traditions in doing that. So just a broad overview of that, if you could start with that and summarize that, that would be great. All right, uh, it's a lot to summarize, bismillah. Um, so we tend to think of modern education as a kind of neutral thing. It's a neutral, universal, uh, because it's so ubiquitous now, we don't even notice that it has a particularity. Like think of Western clothing. When people just think of clothing, think of you don't realize it has a particular history to it. It's only when you come across people who dress differently, oh, there are other ways to dress. The same is true of uh, education. Um, so the colonial, uh, generally uh, in the African context, it, it was uh, Britain and France, but then other contexts, Spain and Portugal, uh, as well through Germany and a few places. When they colonized these areas um, of, of the world, uh, they, for a number of reasons, they were faced with the, one being they were faced with the challenge of how to govern these vast swaths of land with only a few colonial officers. And uh, they actually say this explicitly. Uh, one of the French directors of uh, the French West Africa said, the best means we have at our disposal to control the population is education, is to get them when they're young and to mold their minds and their customs to our purposes. And this is the foundations of uh, most of the educational systems around the world. And even in those countries that weren't colonized, like if you take Japan, for example, or Turkey, in the modernization efforts in a way to catch up with the West, they adapted, uh, adopted uh, Western curricula and Western modes of education. Now these modes of education uh, basically taught um, the students about themselves from the French perspective or from the English perspective, from the outside. So they develop a kind of double consciousness, a knowledge of self as other, mm -hmm. as Du Bois said. And so you're taught history from uh, uh, not just an English, but a modern English perspective. So it's, it's not the same thing as, I don't know, let's say some medieval Orthodox monks came in and were teaching people the trivium and quadrivium. It's, it's, a modern, um, it's a modern curriculum. So there are modern approaches to uh, modern understandings of what knowledge is. Um, modern understandings of what history is, how it works, who has knowledge and who does not. And so basically these children were taught uh, that they and their ancestors were barbarians and uncivilized, lacking culture, and that they were being brought culture and civilization and knowledge by, um, by the, the colonizers. And this wasn't just limited to Africa or brown places. The English tried to do the same thing in Ireland. The Irish language was almost wiped out. Um, uh, so the, you're essentially taught that you and your culture and your people's culture are uh, all but worthless. Um, and it's not uh, just the curriculum that, that was taught, uh, it's also the way in which instruction happened. Mm -hmm. So in traditional systems of education, knowledge was always connected to the sacred, was connected to piety. To know more was to be more and to be better. And so piety and the development of virtue and ethics was always a part of education. There's a famous saying that uh, teaching someone without training them in virtue is like selling a sword to a thief. Mm. You be also bear responsibility in, in that. Um, and this, this is true not just in the Islamic civilization, but uh, Chinese, uh, the South Asian world, all, virtually all over the place. Knowledge is powerful and it's connected to virtue. And so training in virtue is important. That's not the case in modern Western education. People pay lip service, we need civic virtues and things like that. But the fact is you can be a great mathematician or quantum physicist and a jerk. <laughs> it's not, that is not the way things, you cannot be uh, Sheikh al-Islam, you can't be a great pundit. You can't be a great Confucian scholar without having, uh, actually practicing the virtues. So the relationship between knowledge and practice, between knowledge and being, between knowledge and virtue, was thought of differently. And because there's a different epistemology, there is a different pedagogy. It's a different form of teaching. 
So this, this is just a, I, I could keep talking on and on no, no, about no, this. No, that's good. So it, I wrote a, tried to write a whole article about it, but hopefully that serves <laughs> as a useful I, and introduction. And I highly encourage people who have not read it to read it. Um, I want to pick up on something you just said and ask Mamza something, because what the British, for instance, did, and I suspect this is broadly of the French and others as well, in colonizing countries was, as you said, what they were teaching wasn't, they were not trying to produce philosopher kings, if you will. They were trying to teach English language enough so that can, people can serve as civil servants in administrative jobs, essentially. They were, you know, it was a very basic level. It wasn't about teaching virtues or any of that. It's functional, if you will, or vocational. Um, but, you know, Imam Zayed, one thing I wanted to ask you was, do you see colonization um, and what uh, Ulu Dhamini just talked about as um, essentially, you know, a case of clear-cut case of winners and losers of the colonized and the uh, colonizers? Um, or do you see any benefits, even though there may be unintended benefits? Okay. I, I think the colonizers, some benefited, but I think if, if, if social benefit is benefit that accrues to a society. Mm -hmm. What has the West, except for an educated elite who themselves usually approach the issue from a sense of superiority, and illustrated by the fact you, you pointed to Orientalist that I know this religious tradition better than most of these people, and I have the luxury of not practicing it. So if an Orientalist really benefited, he or she would practice it because, and I think this is something Dr. Oludamani talks about in his article, uh, in the, the sense that if, if uh, benefit is, there's more to knowledge than language. So these were philologists by and large. There's a cultural aspect. There's a moral aspect. And when you don't, take that on, then any potential benefit, I think, will be severely challenged by what you don't take on. Um, Father Francisco, I, I, you can add to uh, any, any, you can respond to anything they like, but I, they said, but I want to also ask you um, about Christianity. Christianity has, you know, uh, it's been uh, a missionary faith, just like Islam has been, and has often been disparagingly described by its critics of colonialism as something that has been imposed on traditional peoples as well. And that it has helped eliminate their, their, their traditional cultures and their religious and cultural heritage. Um, how do you see the relationship between Christianity and colonialism, um, especially as it relates to education in the colonized world? I mean, do you see that there's any connection there? Do you see that that's the religious part I'm talking about, the, the conflation of Christianity and uh, colonialism? There's a, <clears throat> there's a marvelous uh, New Zealand film from the late 80s or early 90s, um, the title of which is a Polynesian word, utu. It means reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in, you know, much like the, the concept might function in, in ancient Greece, to be good to one's friends and terrifying to one's enemies, this film focuses on a period of the Maori Wars in which uh, Maori troops fighting for the British are deployed against uh, Maori uh, guerrillas in rebellion against the British. And the, the centerpiece of the drama focuses on two brothers, one who is a sergeant for the British, for the British and, the other rebel. and the other who is the leader of the rebellion. It's the Tefeke Rebellion. It's well known in, in South, uh, South Pacific history. And um, at one point, uh, the British commander is looking at some document sent from, from London and he can't decipher what's written. And the Maori sergeant reads it aloud, it's French, and translates it mm. for his <laughs> British officer. 
to which the British officer replies, you've never been to France. <laughs> and the Maori says, I've never been to England. <laughs> I only mention this because um, it, it seems to me to suggest that teaching European languages to non-Europeans is potentially a very dangerous thing indeed. <laughs> I remember um, late in the 1990s, there was an anthology of post-colonial uh, literary criticism entitled, The Empire Writes Back. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, well, of course. Right. Um, given the, the tools of the liberal arts, even when they are deployed for explicitly colonial purposes, is nonetheless a dangerous thing. Because, uh, you know, however much I may feel certain that Plato or Aristotle or uh, Cicero or Quintilian or any of the usual suspects mm -hmm. mean or imply one thing for the organization of culture and society, the minute you start reading those texts through the lens of your own cultural commitments and your own experience, they can be very dangerous indeed. And, <clears throat> you know, Christianity, particularly in the contemporary period, has... Uh, dealt explicitly with this issue in theological terms. Uh, probably everyone is familiar with the concept of liberation theology, yes. which is precisely a rereading of biblical revelation through the lens of poverty and oppression. Now, in point of fact, that process didn't just emerge in the 1960s and the 1970s in Central and South America. It had already been underway because in order to make religious doctrine of any kind a tool for colonization, mm -hmm. you have to open the text itself. And sooner or later, that text, if indeed it is revelatory, will begin to reveal. Right. And revelatory discourse is precisely the kind of thing that tears through cultural paradigms and critiques even the culture that first introduced the revelatory discourse. I, I understood the question a little. I, I, no, I, I understood that question, your answer, but I think that uh, there's another way to look at the relationship between Christianity and colonization, and that's from the perspective, there were a lot of indigenous Christian communities in Africa and the Middle East that were just as much victims mm -hmm. of European colonization exactly. and European Christians bringing that colonization as Muslims or uh, other, other people in Ethiopia or North Africa or Palestine or mm -hmm. Syria or Iraq. So I, I think that we can create sort of a false universal out of Christianity and miss the particular experiences of Christian peoples who were indigenous to those lands that were colonized by the Europeans. No, that's a good point because I think the, the question I had was about Christianity and be, Christianity being conflated with colonialism. And so that's a good answer, but go ahead. I'd like to take it a step further as well too. The, um, so the missionaries and the colonial power sometimes were allied and sometimes they were at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. France had the Dreyfus affair and that led to certain splits. But the particular, um, most of the, uh, the Western powers that engaged in these imperialist projects were mostly Christian societies or post-Christian societies. And it was a particular form of Christianity or post-Christianity that, that was uh, being practiced that was uh, wedded with white supremacy. In fact, it, was, it led to the white supremacy emerged from this particular sh shift in the Enlightenment, from a kind of medieval thing where you have the, uh, the grand chain of being, scala naturae, in which you have God on the top, angels, saints, all the way down to rocks. 
Now what happens in the Enlightenment is God is, as you lose this faculty called the intellectus, you used to have super rational faculty, intellectus, ratio, reason, and senses. You lose the intellectus, which is what allows you to directly intuit or intellect these higher levels of reality. So all you have a reason and the senses. So that upper level of the great chain of being is gone. And so who's on top of the great chain of being? Man. And not just man as universal, but white European rational man. And his reason it used to be your intellect, with kind of the imminent Holy Spirit that marked you as being the highest thing on the chain of being, the closest thing to God, the divine nature within you. Now it's reason. So you get Kant and Hegel and all these people. Reason is the marker, full marker of humanity. Western Europe and Western European man are the only people who have full rationality, so we're the only full human beings. All right, so, and your, your rank on the chain of being is ranked by how close you are culturally uh, and even in physical appearance. So Japanese are better than Chinese because they look more like white people. Persians are better than Arabs. Arabs are better than Africans. So these elaborate hierarchies like angel, hierarchies of angels are replaced by racial hierarchies. So this is the worldview that emerges, emerges out of a Christian context, but a desacralized de de notion of the cosmos, notion of epistemology. And that's what leads to uh, these notions of imperialism, of, of first of all, white supremacy. That's where whiteness is essentially born. Whiteness is born as the transcendence of race, not as one particular ethnic category amongst others but on the transcendence of race. And so now you're defining yourself, you're putting yourself in place of God, basically. And that is, provides the rationale for civilizing. Everyone else suddenly becomes barbarians. W. D. Boyce put it, uh, the, the, black, the Negro went from being seen as a human being, but a, a heathen in, in uh, pre-Renaissance times, after the Enlightenment became a subhuman. So this provided the right, this is the intellectual uh, climate which allowed for the development of these imperialist projects of uh, the liberal project itself too. If you read any of these liberal theorists, Mills, Rawls, these guys were rabid imperialists. Liberalism, they say liberalism, liberal rational societies have the right, nay the duty, through violence or any means necessary to enforce their will and bring liberal rational societies to societies which they deem not which is any society unlike theirs. So it's not just Christianity. You don't have the Orthodox, uh, you don't have an Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is not running around doing this. You know? And there's even actually interesting a distinction between the, the Protestants and the Catholics here. When the Protestants colonize a place, they try to wipe out everybody. When the Catholics colonize, they mix a bit more because they had different doctrines on the, the, the nature of, of, of people. That's why if you go to Latin countries, there'll be more, mix. If you go to some place the Germans colonized or the British, I mean, how many Native Americans are here amongst us today? And it ha entirely has to do with this, this cosmology, which is a distorted uh, view of this traditional sacred Christian cosmology. So it came out of a very particular, came out of a particular form of Christianity, a particular deformation of the traditional philosophy of Christianity, which then led to these uh, modern assumptions, which led to uh, the imperialist project and these other things, the legacy with which we're still living today. Can, can I ask a follow-up? Absolutely, based go ahead. On, based on what uh, Father Francisco mentioned earlier, could Du Bois have critiqued this arrangement uh, so thoroughly were it not for the liberal arts? No, I don't. I, so it's, this is a kind of, Du Bois was able to critique, and it's a question of uh, kind of master's tools with the, destroying the, the master's house with the master's tools. Yeah, so Du Bois, Du Bois was very well educated, and so Du Bois was able to point out the contradictions and the flaws. Okay. Then, uh, what Du Bois, uh, what made him so frustrated, and part of why he went to Ghana at the end of his life, was how do we then construct something different? From an, from an alternative standpoint. So it's like if you're on the plantation, okay, you can use the master's tools to build, tear down the master's house. How do you build something new? If all you have are the master's tools, are you just gonna build another plantation? So th this is what attracted a lot of people to, um, this is what has led to a lot of these different black religious movements. For better or for worse, a desire to have an alternative structure to critique and to view this uh, development from. I think that the tools are there within the traditional Christian Western tradition to critique this, to develop an alternative. It's there, Plato. If you read Plato, if you read Plotinus, if you read St. Thomas Aquinas, the, the material is there to critique and to try to build something, uh, to, to, build, to build something new. 
but it's, it becomes even more clear and more obvious if you study, let's say, Confucian cl classics, Islamic classics, the, and part of it is how it's read, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a certain way of reading Plato and of reading the Bible uh, that's been practiced for a number of years that is perfectly in line with this, I think, this kind of deformation of uh, the, the traditional Western canon, the viewed along this white supremacist, rationalist, uh, rationalist lines. That becomes very clear if you, if you read Plato, let's say, from an Islamic perspective, you read about the divine Aflatun, all of a sudden all these mystical dimensions, uh, quote-unquote mystical, they weren't called mystical then, but you get another view of Plato. And you get to, uh, or if you, let's say, read um, like Pseudo-Dionysus or any of these earlier uh, figures, you get a different view of, of, of Plato, of the Western intellectual tradition. But those people have been marginalized because they, they don't make for good empire building and they don't make for making people good consumers. Right. right. I, th I think, yeah, what you mentioned earlier is probably one of the reasons Du Bois was so frustrated mm -hmm. with Booker T. Washington. Yes. yes. You're just building another plantation. Exactly. exactly. Well, black folks are running it. Exactly. Father Francisco, I wanted to just ask you about the thing that Ola Lamine was talking about, um, both about Christianity and. and I mean, there's a feeling in, among Muslims, for instance, that you know, some of the, there's something known as normative Islam, that we call it, or mainstream Islam, if you will, um, and then there are these extremists who take religion and then find, so do you see anything parallel happening in the colonial world about what he was talking about with Christianity and the loss of the intellect, as he said? I mean, those, is that how you understand Christianity and, and, and what happened with it? I can't pretend that I don't have a very uh, specific attitude toward the kind of Christianity that gets deployed in the colonial projects. Mm -hmm. um, there, we're, we're often dealing with um, deeply deficient doctrine and discipline. So. I'm not exactly sure what, what to say, except that the, the Western tradition is, we can, we can never forget that it's a construct, and a fairly late construct as well. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in, uh, I mean, returning for a moment to Professor Ogunaike's article and the notion of canon, the one with two ends, not with three ends, <laughs> um, a canon, is a, a measure or an authoritative uh, collection or standard of some kind that makes us, it seems to me, want to ask necessarily, and what is the authority that established this canon? So if the authority is Georgian England, mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily going to sign on even to the religious projects, however much we may admire some dimensions of the London Missionary Society, for example. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the real question is what, what constitutes the Western canon? And uh, it seems to me that, I mean, I myself would be perfectly comfortable with a great books program, for example, that didn't teach Shakespeare, Mm -hmm. and didn't teach Dickens. Right. As long as, you know, they were teaching, say, Cervantes mm -hmm. and Perez Galdós, if they were <laughs> right. a, a, an Hispanophone faculty, or, um, the, you know, Voltaire and uh, Montesquieu and so forth. I mean, I think we can, we can do a lot at the later historical ends of the so-called Western canon, that right. don't look anything at all like what they might uh, appear to be in a particular linguistic context. But at the same time, I'd be very leery of uh, some kind of pedagogy that excluded Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, right. and so forth. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that we have to come to terms with ancient thought, and probably not only ancient Greek thought, uh, in order to make sense of contemporary experiences, contemporary cultures, and contemporary literatures. 
So I, I, I what can I say? I, I, I am fully aware mm -hmm. that Christianity, and including Roman Catholic Christianity, has been extensively deployed in colonialist projects. Um, I'm not always comfortable with the doctrinal and disciplinary implications. That's what I was those, getting at. Okay, <laughs> that is uh, deployments, but they are nonetheless there. The real question is, what is the tradition? What is the marrow of the tradition? How do we get close enough to it to be able to uh, begin to critique the tradition itself and not? not merely the tradition's deployment in contemporary society. Well, Namini, go ahead. You yeah, were so I, I wanted to, I, I completely agree with your latter point about what the tradition is. So a lot of what we think of when we think of so-called Western tradition, we forget that this idea of the West, it's a very late one. It's 18th century yeah. at the earliest. And this 18th century notion of the West is actually very much anti the tradition that they call the Western tradition. So I usually try to call it the so-called Western tradition as opposed to the actual Western tradition because what they really, when we're talking about the Western tradition, we're not talking about the West, that doesn't mean anything. We're usually, we're talking about a Christian tradition um, and, and of, of Latin race, basically it's a Latin Christian tradition. That's the intellectual, which continues to this day. Right. There are Thomas, there are people working in that tradition. It's not something that died out. And we also tend to think of Plato, Pla Aristotle, Plotinus as somehow belonging to the, the Western tradition. Whereas if you talk to any Islamic philosopher, like the, the people who, who taught me, they have Isnads going back to Ibn Sina and Farabi and right, from, Farabi, right. from Farabi to Plotinus and Plato. Uh, for them, they see Islamic philosophy as the trunk and quote unquote Western philosophy as a branch that kind of went wrong somewhere. It's not, it's the, 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 the Greek world, the ancient Greek world was part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Right. It's part of the Eastern, including Egypt, Alexandria, and the, so like the title, uh, reading Aristotle in Islamabad, people reading Aristotle in Islamabad before they were reading it in Britain. <laughs> uh, or they were reading it in Senegal before they were reading it in Britain. Uh, maybe, maybe. I'm, yeah. not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident because the Abbasid Empire was there. Um, but the Ar Aristotle was, all of the Aristotle we have today was available in Baghdad in the 10th century. So it's, Ar Aristotle is not, some, is not uh, a Western thing. Yes, the, the, the Latin Catholic tradition took up Aristotle, but took up Aristotle largely on the basis of the commentaries and translations of Muslim authors, Ibn Rushd, uh, Ibn Sina, Etc. So the, this, the, the ancient Greeks don't just belong to the, the so-called Western tradition. Uh, they're an integral part of these Eastern Christian traditions, the Byzantine and the Islamic tradition, and the Jewish philosophical traditions uh, as well too. As Father rightly said, these ancient traditions, um, so we know from, uh, from several of Plato's dialogues, he believed that ancient Egyptian wisdom was the source of a lot of uh, Greek wisdom. Plotinus and several other philosophers supposedly uh, went on military campaigns to India to have discussions with the sages of India. And anyone who knows Advaita Vedanta a little bit, you look at Advaita Vedanta and Plotinus and you can clearly see there are some similarities uh, there, there as well too. So these, these ancient traditions, I think it was Whitehead who said the, the history of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes on Plato. I mean, look, you think <laughs> yeah. relativism, deconstructionism, right. a lot of these trends you can find prefigured in the dialogues of Plato, and not just the dialogues of Plato, in the commentaries and in the discussions on them that you find in it. So I believe ancient philosophy is very relevant uh, to us today, not just Greek, but ancient South Asian, the Dharmic world, ancient Chinese. We have a lot to learn from, from them. Looking at the Greek, if, if you are the modern West and you've defined yourself in opposition to Islam, you have to take the Greeks out of the Islamic tradition. Otherwise, your, your whole project fails at the start. Imam Zaid, you Notice, know. however, that that's precisely what uh, the, the Protestant Reformation does. The rejection of the scholastic synthesis is the elimination of Aristotle from the equation. So that, uh, yes, the Greeks are reappropriated, not on the basis of the philosophical tradition, but on the basis of the rhetorical tradition. I mean, I think what yeah. Oldamini is talking about. And, and you could say a certain extent on the basis of the political tradition, right. where, in, in the sense that uh, the, the political structure of society is, 
is deeply rooted in slavery, is deeply rooted in denying large sectors, the women, the slaves, uh, the barbarians, any sort of uh, meaningful rights. And that becomes reflected in the colonial project to a large extent. So, and, and this, of course, is a, is a re-reading of the, the Greek sources absolutely. for democracy, for example, without the multi-century long commentary tradition. So that kind of rereading permits a complete reinterpretation of it as so well. Kind of Wahhabi reading of the Greeks. Throw out the tradition, <laughs> back to the sources, read what we want into it. And, and, and leave a, a path of destruction in our wake. No, actually, the point you made, I, mean, I was going to read a paragraph from your article, but you pretty much um, talked about that, but I think it's an eloquent um, uh, statement of it. And here's the paragraph. Why do the ancient Greeks belong to the West and not alter to the Byzantine or Islamic worlds? After all, Greece spent a millennium under Byzantine rule and half of that under Ottoman rule. And the scholars in 10th century Baghdad translated into Arabic virtually all of Aristotle's works we have today in English. And why don't the great and greatly influential Muslim thinkers of Andalusia, like Ibn Rashid and Ibn Arabi, belong to the Western tradition? So he said, we, the, we have drawn some strange constellations in the night sky filled with brilliant works of literature, philosophy, and science. Uh, Imam Zayed, I'd like to ask you what, uh, to shed a little bit of light on, because this is not very well known, it seems to me, is the, um, that the Muslims translated a lot of the Hellenistic um, uh, works, and they also had a great influence on European thinkers. And can you share some light on the Islamic intellectual tradition, which studied other civilizations, and the talk about whether this kind of, I mean, obviously it muddles a distinction between what we're talking about, the Western, what is the Western tradition, what is the Islamic tradition, but part of what is not clear to, uh, is this idea of the Islamic tradition, which sort of was a bridge, if you will, right? Yeah. I, Between I the Hellenistic and then what came after in the Enlightenment. I, I think one of the geniuses of what we refer to as Islamic civilization is that the Muslims, and to a certain extent owing to geography, but also owing to a worldview, brought many civ civilizational legacies into conversation with each other. So you had the, the Greek, the Hellenistic, but you also had the Confucian, because the Muslims were bordering China. You had the Hindu, Hindic, Muslims pushed into South Asia and the Indian subcontinent. And Muslims were able to borrow from all of these traditions. And that became reflected in uh, some major theological problems were solved through Muslim contact with the Buddhist. Mm -hmm. so, that, that. that came from the Buddhist when the Muslims went into present day Afghanistan. So you, you were borrowing from the Buddhist, from the Hindus, from the Confucian, from the Hellenistic, and serving as a bridge primarily though to transmitting that heritage to the West, but also in those other areas, just not as well known because Western civilization became hegemonic. And so there's more emphasis on the relationship between the Muslims and, and the Hellenistic, but those sort of relationships and the translation projects involved other civilizational legacies also. I'll just add to that, this notion of the Islamic civilization as a kind of bridge, that kind of the West had this knowledge and then they fell into these dark ages and they passed the torch on to the Muslims and the Muslims held on to it for a while and then tossed the ball back to them. <laughs> and then for 800 years, Muslims just like smoked shisha and played with their prayer beads <laughs> until they discovered oil and they woke up. Like, that's totally false. Uh, that's a Eurocentric view of, of history. So How would you unpack that? Well, so I, the, the Muslims, uh, developed, as Imam Zaid eloquently said, engage with all of these different civilizations and intellectual traditions, and due to the kind of epistemological orientation of the Islamic tradition itself, wisdom is the lost property of the believer. The Prophet mm -hmm. said, seek knowledge unto China. Al-Kindi, one of the earliest uh, philosophers to work in Arabic, said truth is, uh, we should not be ashamed to accept and acknowledge the truth from wherever it comes. For the person who seeks the truth, nothing is greater value than the truth from wherever it comes from. So with this kind of attitude, Muslims went everywhere and tried to learn everything from everybody. 
And so they created this very unique and compelling synthesis, which was their own civilization. And then due to uh, the fall of the Byzantine Empire and a few other things, and then the translations from Arabic to Latin and Toledo moving in, those things influenced the Western world. But the, the later developments of Islamic philosophy uh, didn't really have much influence in the Western world. So the, the standard uh, scholarship has been Islamic philosophy and thought kind of ended with Ibn Rushd. Maybe they'll push it back a few, because that was the last thinker to have a significant impact on the West. That was not the last significant thinker in the Islamic world by any means. Mm -hmm. There are still prominent Islamic philosophers, theologians, wrestling with uh, these problems, but within their own tradition. And the fact that they, the, their traditions are only now starting to be understood, uh, studied, influential in Western traditions. Uh, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist, it just means some people weren't paying attention to them. Father Francisco. Can I just say oh, something? Sure. That, that's a very, uh, very excellent and deep point. Because when the, what will become the Western world didn't find anything beneficial in Islamic thought, and intellectual activity, then the Muslims stagnated and it was just super commentaries, super duper commentaries, but you still have uh, major thinkers within that tradition who are still very active in pushing that particular project forward. Right, and and right. culminating many of the great uh, Ottoman scholars mm -hmm. like Tash Kuprazade yes. and others. So that, that whole idea that, oh, the Muslims just stagnated because there's nothing we find beneficial, is, it's a myth. And I think mo a lot of Muslims have internalized that yes. myth. Good point. Father Francisco, you had something to add. I was just going to ask, um, especially Professor Ugo Naike, if Western uh, political powers um, inserting themselves into Africa and South Asia and East Asia, find that the immediate project is to subdue native culture and then to construct some kind of subaltern culture. It strikes me that you cannot um, deploy Greek, Roman, Hellenistic thinking without pushing the colonialist agenda backwards before you can push it forwards. In other words, first you have to colonize Aristotle, don't you? Well, that's precisely what they did. Yeah. I mean, they, in a certain sense, um, they colonized Aristotle in their, their reading of Aristotle themselves to, make them, to put themselves as basically gods on earth, masters of the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, so they created a colonial, just like they created a colonial Bible. I mean, we actually have Bibles that they would give slaves where they would black out some of the sections and tear out some of the pages. Mm -hmm. They'd leave in the, you know, obey your, obey your masters, this is right. They would leave out the parts about justice. They took out the whole book of Exodus mm -hmm. and these things. So, of course, I mean, what are you going to... So the, the, the so colonial they, but, project but the, is, the, the, is already representing a kind of... The colonial, uh, it's, it's, it's premised upon a deformation of the Christian tradition. That's what allows it to happen. That's why you don't see, yes, you have imperialisms and you have things like that before, but nothing like what we see, nothing with the, the scale, the hegemony, and the brutality of the modern imperialist project. In some ways, they, they make Alexander the Great look like a kinder, kindergarten teacher. Alex, Alexander the Great conquers you, you still have your language, you still practice your religion, you still have your culture. These traditions, they, they try to leave nothing in their, in their wake. They're, thankfully, alhamdulillah, they didn't succeed everywhere, but a lot of places they have, and that's, that's a real tragedy. Dr. Oludamini, you mentioned in your article how, you mentioned this term nec uh, necrolinguistics, oh that we, a lot of people increasingly, particularly in your, what you cite in, in Africa, they half know a lot of languages, but not, anyone thoroughly enough to be immersed in the culture that accompanies that language. So how, how do you square this? It seems like what Father Francisco is saying is very positive. Like people know a lot of languages and that implies something very positive, but what you're saying is very negative. So well, I, was, I, I think necrolinguistics is at the opposite end of the spectrum from multilingualism. 
Multilingualism is having a mastery of several languages. And what I'm trying to argue for in the article is I think the ideal we should be striving for is a kind of intellectual multilingualism. Right. We should have people who are able to think in, uh, have a certain degree of fluency in multiple traditions. Mm -hmm. Just, and, just and like that's, just. That's my point. So when mentioning language, is language synonymous with the entire cultural universe that that language is a part of? Or is just mastery of the language in and of itself conveying some really strong uh, benefit to I think the possessors? It, I think it does. Language carries in its structures, in its idioms, in its proverbs, uh, so much of the cultural and intellectual heritage. I mean, just think about if you really master Quranic Arabic, Quranic Arabic, Fusa, has been shaped, it has a kind of Weltansch, a worldview that's been shaped by the Islamic revelation. That's Izutsu's it's Izutsu's whole, it's Izutsu's whole, whole premise. The same thing if you, master, uh, if you master Sanskrit, that gives you a whole different way of thinking about things. If you master Chinese, that gives you a whole different way. I mean, they've been uh, doing all kinds of psychological studies. When you think in a different language, you also think in a different way. You guys are on the same page. Yeah, so I, 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 agree, <laughs> I, agree, I agree there's a richness, but I also agree there's a, there's a danger, and the danger is precisely if you introduce, if you have someone who's only half fluent in Yoruba, half fluent in English, half fluent in Arabic, and you don't have mastery of any of these languages, that is, creates a serious problem where you can't communicate flu And this is leaving aside the possibility of these new pidgin languages developing that are full, kind of full languages in their own, that are Creoles. Uh, but this, this creates a kind of intellectual muzzling. In fact, the colonial powers actually used to do this. They used to teach their uh, native soldiers pidgin French. They wouldn't teach them full French. They teach them a kind of baby French to kind of cripple their communication skills, to keep them at this kind of level. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. this is what's being done educationally uh, to people um, around the world. You reference the native communities here. The, uh, yeah, there's a, a really sad article about this young man, White, White Thunder, from the Menominee tribe, and he said his English is atrocious, uh, and it's even worse than his Menominee, which is also bad. But th this was intentional. I mean, the, 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 right. my father went to a boarding school in Nigeria, um, and the reason why he went, to, and my grandfather also went to a boarding school, and the reason was they wanted to isolate them from the influence of native culture. And the same thing was done to the First Nations people in Canada and here and elsewhere. Isolate them from their culture, give them a little bit of edu enough education to make them useful and to make them good consumers, but not enough so they can talk back to you and rebel. I want to share my own personal, I grew up in India as a Muslim. And, you know, to speaking of languages, I learned three languages, you know, but not very well, obviously. I mean, I spoke Urdu and then I learned English and I had uh, Hindi as well. Um, but in growing up, and this is back to the colonial uh, impact that you talked about, um, I studied, you know, a lot of Western uh, uh, books and great works, and you know, including more recent uh, in literature, for instance, I read Shakespeare, I read you know, Dickens, I uh, even read Harper Lee's, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. These were all, and then we, act, we had drama classes and we, we acted in plays from these people. My point about all of that is I actually learned a lot from that myself about virtues, as you talked about, about ethics and morality that was contained in these works. Um, so from your point, Aladamini, what you were saying, would you see that as something, uh, and it wasn't just me, there were millions of others who had the similar experience that I did. Uh, would you see that as something that we clearly, that I, that education for me came somewhat clearly at the expense of not learning the great works of Urdu or Persian or Arabic literature, for instance, right? right? So is that part of the, going back to your original point, because it, but there's still benefits to me from what I learned, right? Yes. How would you? So uh, two, thi two things. One is uh, absolutely you can learn things from Shakespeare. You can learn things from, from Dickens. The thing is, Shakespeare and Dickens, as you said, they come and they replace Saadi, they replace Amir Khusro, and it's not just a substitution of uh, apples for oranges. Mm -hmm. So implicit in the curriculum, even if you don't actually come out and say it, implicit in the curriculum is the literature of your people is of no value. Ethics and virtue are learned from this literature which comes from over here. 
And that's implicit, and that's the case for like African Americans in this country today. You're implicitly taught that Africa is nothing, has no history, and therefore you have no history and you're nothing. That's why they did these, have you seen these doll tests where they, you know, they did this experiment with Brown v. Board of Education, they came back and did it again in the early 2000s. They have a little girl come and show her a black doll, show a black doll and white doll and ask her which one she wants. Which yeah. one? They always choose the white, the white doll. Dog, yeah. Why? <clears throat> she's pretty, she's this, she's that. That's not natural, that's taught. And that's taught through, the, it's subtle, but it's taught in that, in that curriculum. So the replacement, it's not just, okay, I replace, here, sh can put Shakespeare in for Saadi, no problem. It's not neutral like that. Moreover, Shakespeare is coming from, it's a very interesting thing to read Shakespeare in Lucknow. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, actually, interestingly, given the social structures, people in Lucknow can understand Shakespeare a lot better than people, kind of contemporary Londoners, in, in some ways. Um, but uh, the Saadi comes out of the same intellectual tradition. And there's a kind of confluence with that Saadi's quoting Quran, he's making allusions to Hadith, he's making, and it, it forms a part of an integral uh, atmosphere in which you can live and breathe and develop as a person. As I said before, when this colonial curriculum creates a kind of schizophrenia, what Du Bois called the double consciousness, mm -hmm. in which you relate to yourself and your tradition and your history as other. You don't learn the history of uh, South Asia, of West Africa, from the point of view of West Africa, from the Islamic point of view. You learn it from the European point of view. I mean, people were being taught in Pakistan up until very recently that Islamic philosophy ended with Ibn Rushd. Meanwhile, there are Islamic philosophers down the street <laughs> right. working, but then you go to school in the English language school and you're being taught, this, you're being taught yourself as other. Mm. And that has profound psychological, spiritual, and political ramifications, which we can see, which we're still dealing with um, today. So yes, I, I think it's, it's good. There's a lot to be gained from Shakespeare. Uh, I think it's good that people learn Shakespeare. And given the ubiquity and the hegemony of the Western world, you have to understand it. We have to understand it in order to deal with it. But we can't give up on those traditions which were bequeathed to us by our forefathers, by our foremothers. Can I say something about Absolutely. Shakespeare? Sure. <laughs> we take Shakespeare completely for granted, but uh, until the beginning of the 19th century, roughly the beginning of the, the First World War, mm -hmm. Ariosto was yeah. more widely read than Shakespeare. Good point, yeah. And um, oh, by the way, if y'all haven't read Ariosto, get to it. <laughs> You'll love it. It's a fantastic read, the Orlando Furioso. And it's partly because it's such a vigorous, fant fantastic, subversive read that it was so popular for so many centuries. What happened in the course of the First World War is uh, a, a kind of comprehensive re-evaluation of the so-called classics mm -hmm. with a keen awareness of the fact that the great scholars of the quote-unquote classics were largely to be found in German faculties. And uh, Terry Eagleton makes the argument <clears throat> that it is a concerted effort on the part of the United States, Canada, Australia, but especially Britain, to replace the classics of Roman and Greek literature with the new classics of English literature <clears throat> in order precisely to remove the ancient uh, learning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the influence of Germans uh, uh, and that, that impact on Anglophone populations. And this is the point at which, you know, uh, we previously had seen Latin schools that had English programs. This is the point at which English becomes the medium, medium for yeah. the transmission of the studia humanitatis, the humanities. The humanities. Yeah. And it has continued without interruption to the present day, today on any college campus. It's not the Department of Philosophy or the Department of Classics that reigns, as it were, over the humanities. It's the English department. Right. English is the repository for philosophy, for critical theory, for literature, for Relativism, rhetoric. Relativism, deconstruction. Yeah, and uh, has, has become the, 
the, the great um, arbiter, as it were, of the humanities for everyone. And now English departments are under a certain amount of distress because uh, of the practicality of studying in the STEM disciplines. So English is reinventing itself as the discipline that makes it possible for STEM to communicate across disciplinary boundaries. But what is that if not ancient Greek rhetoric <laughs> That's true. having been appropriated In by an explicitly anglophone cluster of great works? Yeah, I, th I think it's also uh, you're taking those classics, ancient classics, out of their religious context. It's a secularizing uh, of knowledge, and so you're introducing secular classics as the new canon. And you're trying to teach morality and ethics through those books, and you fail miserably. I mean, Alan Bloom says it's a failed project. And, and I think a lot of what's going on is an admission that the English department's appropriation of the humanities, just as the humanities couldn't appropriate religion and succeed, English, especially the critical theory aspect of it, couldn't appropriate the humanities and, and succeed. And so the, I think it's an admission of failure that we have to now come with something else to teach ethics and morality without returning to religion, because if we return to religion, we're admitting total, total failure of the Western secular project. And, uh, but the alternatives, what we see is just the total denigration of the human, human dignity as we know it. I just completely agree. In fact, the humanities emerges as out of the Renaissance project as a kind of attempt to create a space for the secular. Before that, you had the trivium quadrivium. There's no humanities and then philosophy and these greater sciences. But so the, even the, the term humanities itself emerges out of this idea to try to create a form of humanity apart from religion. Mm. That you have that, that man is something that you can create an idea of man apart from God, apart from the divine, apart from the transcendent. And that project is bound to fail. That's why notions, you can all have these terms, human dignity. But what does dignity mean without any concept of transcendence? If we're all just atoms bouncing around, what's my, how do I have any more dignity than this table? Why do I have any reason to love my, my fellow man, love my son, if I'm just molecules bouncing around? It fails, logically. You can, people make arguments of utilitarianism or social expediency, but those ultimately don't, don't work. Um, and so I think we're, we're seeing a kind of the humanities is under assault for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that it, it cut away its own foundations from the beginning, and so the last dominoes are just fallen. And do you get, all of you see this, um, you know, the great books as we talk about today, this was, I think, uh, something that the Encyclopedia Britannica came up with, I think, in the 50s, in the 1950s, to come up with the well, list Well, Mortimer of, Adler, yeah. Yeah, who's yeah the, Mortimer the, Adler, the brainchild exactly. behind Adler was part of it. What is that, does that list of great books embody the things we're talking about, that, was, that religion was kind of shunted away from that? Yes, this, this was a kind of, I'll let you, well, well, Adler found I religion, think so. didn't he? Yeah, you I'm sorry, what? Uh, Mortimer Adler found religion, ex yes. post facto, didn't he? Yes. And, and I, it, there's no doubt in my mind that it is a long-term familiarity with and dedication to the study of those great works that, that um, brought him closer and closer and closer to the, the point where he was ready to accept baptism. So I would say it, it emerged in part as a kind of conservative effort um, with as a dissatisfaction with the way education was going. Um, it also co interestingly coincides with the beginning, it predates the beginning of the civil rights movement, but it, in a certain sense co coincides with the beginning of these uh, kind of black awakening, Garvey, and these, these kind of movements, and the admission of people like Du Bois to, to universities, right. and the questioning of, uh, you have the beginning in the early 20th century um, amongst some sensitive orientalists, uh, amongst people like Du Bois and others, of this quote unquote so-called Western tradition and so-called Western canon. Um, and so part of it is a response to the disintegration of the humanities that we're talking about, but part of it also is this kind of right-wing reactionary response to the questioning of the West, this post-colonial questioning of the Western canon. So kind of reconstruct 
uh, an ideal canon and I have this all this. That's why you have these groups like the Proud Boys and these other people, these like right. neo-Nazi white supremacist groups talking about Western civilization. That's the new favorite, favorite term. This has its roots going back into the, the kind of conservative reactionary elements of, of the creation and the valorization of this, of this Western canon. So it's an attempt to redress uh, this foundational problem, you know, the divorce of knowledge from the sacred, the, the creation of the, the, the secular, to try to have humanity without sanctity, without religion, but without addressing the uh, concomitant white supremacy mm -hmm. and particularism mm -hmm. uh, that, that as, as, as a result of that. And as I say somewhere else, like the, these thinkers, um, they're not wrong because they're racist, they're racist because they're wrong about knowledge and humanity and, 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 and the well, That's a good distinction to make. Kind of running out of time, so I'd like to ask all of you a kind of general question, but which I think summarizes a lot of the discussion that we've been having here, <clears throat> which was a question kind of um, uh, we wanted to raise in conceiving this, uh, this event and this program was, you know, the idea of how can we truly free our minds from the legacies, of, you know, the colonial um, legacies in, in, in the intellectual tradition. Um, which is a question about tradition itself. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, is there even such a thing as our own tradition? I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, when I mentioned the Shakespeare and Dickens and this kind of thing, but whether we like it or not, Shakespeare and Dickens have been studied in South Asia for more than 100 years, right? I mean, so they've kind of become part of that tradition almost. Not, not as an ancient thing, but, but it, it, for over 100 years is over 100 years. I mean, I, I think that, so there are different aspects of it. So my question is more about our, how we conceive of tradition anymore. Um, so is there such a thing as our own tradition, given all of the influences um, that bear onto our own tradition in many ways? Um, and does tradition deny itself when it denies all aspects of itself, you know, including the impact of other cultures upon it? So just to kind of share your thoughts, if you will, each one of you, I'd like you to do that um, about tradition, because that's really, and, and, and when, we, when we study other traditions, and this I'll, I'll add to that, when we study other traditions, um, are we looking at it as kind of, as an outsider studying that tradition? You know, there's that issue as well. So just start, if you would, Father Francisco, to talk about that. Well, first of all, just so you know what I, what I understand the word tradition to mean, uh, in Catholicism, tradition is a custom, a disposition, a ritual um, that's, that ha whose origins are uh, from time immemorial. In other words, whose origins we cannot identify. So if that's what a tradition is, mm -hmm. 100 years doesn't do it. Right. And uh, neither does uh, you know, something that we can really identify in a particular historical context. We can, because the minute we do that, then we contextualize it in political, cultural, pedagogical ways. And that's presumably not what tradition is meant to be. So, um, we have customs uh, in pedagogy, in culture, in literature, and I think that they are potentially very valuable indeed, but not without examination and interpretation. Mm -hmm. And the processes of investigation and interpretation are, at least potentially, highly subversive. So, you know, I, 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 I want to teach Shakespeare, mm -hmm. Aristotle, mm -hmm. Quintilian, not necessarily because I have a particular goal in mind in doing so, but because I have great confidence that these texts will stimulate the critical apparatus which in the end is an apparatus that I don't control. Right. So, nonetheless, I'm, you know, I've seen again and again and again people turn to virtue decisively because they are, for the first time, being asked to consider things that are not otherwise raised 
in the culture that surrounds them. And that's a transformative moment and one eminently worth the, the risks of subversion. And that, to add to that, I mean, I think that um, that definition you just gave, if that is it, then regardless of which tradition you're teaching, you could have the same kind of benefit from it that you just talked about, right? In terms of the virtue that it may inculcate. Yeah. Again, we, our only access to tradition is investigation and interpretation. Right. So, and that is part of tradition itself, the investigation, exploration, ex and exchanges, and among scholars. Imam Zaid, go ahead. I think uh, there are many ways to look at tradition. Uh, I choose to look at it from uh, a Muslim historical perspective. And in the sense there's certain tradition is a combination of those immutable aspects of Islamic law, theology slash philosophy and ethics that cannot be disposed of. And that combined with assimilating contributions from the peoples and cultures that the Muslims came into contact with. And so that immutable aspect with assimilating those enriching aspects from other cultures creates Islamic tradition. And I think that process, it, it has to play itself out here in America also. And that Islamic tradition, tradition will con continue. When the immutable is no longer, no longer has the capability to assimilate, it's no longer Islamic. And it becomes uh, something that's culturally assimilative to something culturally hegemonic. And when that happens, you lose tradition in the name of traditionalism, if that makes sense. That does, yes, please. I have views very similar to Imam uh, Zaid on this. So tradition, if you think about it in Arabic, I, people sometimes translate tradition as taqlid. It's not what I mean when I think about tradition. I think of tradition as sunnah or sunnati. Um, in the sense of, as you said, it's a habitus, but tradition always has a sacred origin. The origins are sacred. It's like a spring that gushes up from the earth, a rain that falls down that then continues uh, as a river. So you have an immutable transcendent principle, principle or principles as Imam Zaid, and these are transcendent. And because they're transcendent, wherever they're applied, each new situation, each new area, it'll be different and it'll be evolved. But there's a continuity with what came before it because of these immutable principles. So it's always changing, it's ever evolving, but the immutable principles are not. And so it can always integrate new, new traditions, streams can merge on the basis of these immutable principles. And the same is true for other traditions uh, as well too. If they're found, if they have these immutable, once you get rid of those immutable principles, once those principles are no longer transcendent, if they become imminent, or if there's no notion of transcendence at all or immutability and everything is just changed, then you no longer have a tradition then you just have discourse and uh, argumentation um, and fragmentation, ultimately. So this, this is why I think the, this is how integration of other traditions or perspectives work within a tradition, because you have these transcendent immutable principles, and we see thousands of examples of this across time mm -hmm. and, 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 and history. Um, and you also always see when those principles cease to become transcendent, when they become mutable, when they become, that's when the tradition stagnates and fractures and breaks. And I think that's what unites us, that those immutable principles in law, rulings, uh, maxims, objectives, they're, they're shared with other tradition so there's a unity so we could we could argue in terms of abrogation this or the other but that underlying stream mm -hmm. as as you uh, refer to that that's what creates the foundation for us to be able to live together and to have a a, a common bond that allows us to live together in peace imam said made the distinction between tradition and traditionalism 
it's uh, fairly commonplace, at least at one point it was in, in Catholic seminaries, to say that traditionalism is the dead faith of the living, but tradition is the, the living, living faith, faith of, the of the dead. Yeah. And um, if, if there's, I mean, obviously we want to be very careful what falls into the category of tradition and what falls into the category of traditionalism, but it strikes me that we, what, what this um, distinction alerts us to is the fact that there's plenty out there that gets badly labeled, things that we might reject on the grounds that they're called traditionalist, when in fact they have the living faith of the dead in them and deserve our attention. But likewise, things to which we cling mm -hmm. that maybe don't quite merit the title of tradition. So, I mean, th this is, um, I don't think there's any way of speaking about tradition without uh, in inviting uh, uh, the, the necessity of interpretation and clarity right. and dialogue as a consequence, because otherwise, where are we going to where are we going to go? They're static otherwise, yeah. I wanted to address the second half of your question, as in the point of the education, the liberal, to free, free your mind. As you said, all of these uh, traditions, if they really are traditions, in the sense that I, I use the word, their goal is, in Arabic, sa'ada, felicity, uh, in this life and the next. It's a development of an ideal mode of human being. It's identified with wisdom. Uh, and that's real freedom. That's, 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 that's the, the real freedom is being capable of the good. And that takes work and that takes training. Um, but that's something which is, a, as Imam Zayd said, which is a common concern amongst the Confucian traditions, the Dharmic traditions, the Islamic traditions, the Christian traditions, a lot of these indigenous traditions. And I think we, we have a lot to learn from each other, even as we retain our distinct traditions. Great. On that note, um, and the, it's a really good point you, you ended it on, I think, because we have to learn from other traditions as well. And the idea of traditions being sort of um, beginning with the sacred, as you said, I think. Um, those are good points to take away. Please join me in a round of applause for our speakers.